recording recording we're gonna go for about an hour with respect to the introduction to today's day so the apprenticeship involves there's the design sessions and then there's the workshop sessions and then Saturdays what we do is think more heavily about how we involve the whole global community in development the big problem that open source hardware is still trying to solve is people showing up how do you get a lot of people to contribute and continue contributing and the, the answer to that is ultimately has to be livelihood and that's that's why we're shifting a lot from so-called project development to product development so that people can get meaningful livelihoods out of this kind of work now um, over the years that we've done kickstarters we've done some crowdfunding I initially started on on doing fundraising by after I ran out of money out here on the land with a little bit of savings I had from college uh, started crowdfunding and basically put up crowdfunding web baskets on the internet and found that wow people are willing to contribute to this I was publishing a lot of videos uh, with the early work uh, how we settled on the land and how we started building the machines and pretty soon got to the world stage and and today uh, just continuing a bootstrap method and deliberately doing it in a crowdsourced way so that it's replicable so we're not we're not relying on foundation funding to to do this we did get some foundation funding around the TED talk time uh, also became a Shuttleworth fellow so some money from that but by and large um, in order to make it largely replicable we want to we want to focus on the crowd development and that's that's the whole miss mission of collaborative design so that's completely aligned um, I think the over the years the, the learning to date is that we can leverage the concept of what's known as an incentive challenge and we haven't done one yet we've done the crowdfunding and various various other methods hackathons other things and through all these times um, we've done the development team the remote development team and and on-site events but at all times it's um, the amount of people you can get to show up is is limited uh, you're talking about volunteer time and once again it has to get into are you doing something for a living or is this just a pastime something that uh, you can only do when you have free time so the, the solution is to go to the products and make this full time um, but the problem of people showing up has not I don't think has really been solved well in open hardware uh, I, I would say still by and large majority of open source projects they're still kind of the the heroic effort by a small team um, but the the crowdfunding idea does work and the latest on that is I, I want to bring up the, the concept of an incentive challenge so that that is what we're actually planning right now and we're actually allocating a hundred K to that and that's actually where is that coming from that's actually coming from all the Bitcoin donations that we can cash in on but uh, um, we're, we're planning right now to allocate 100k to an incentive challenge it means that there's a financial incentive for people to show up and you might say okay does that work um, according to the latest out there um, I'm going a lot by the book called uh, bold by Peter Diamandis and in that book so if you google that uh, it did mention a lot about the concept of the incentive challenge and I think that is a model that can work so basically you put up a, a prize for some development and then you you reap the benefits of that so but also structuring that and making that work is the challenge how do you do it and also how do you do it collaboratively because if we if you look at a lot of the challenges out there everything is pretty much proprietary the results are proprietary there are some open things but when you do an incentive challenge today typically it's that the result is is proprietary I mean look at the platform called HeroX and we're actually planning to use HeroX it's a well-known platform it's an offshoot of the of the X Prize, which is a very well-known uh, global incentive challenge um, the HeroX platform is more for smaller projects where you also have the ability to crowds fund the actual prize uh, so that's that's an opportunity too but we're gonna say we're gonna come into this serious saying we want to develop something and we want to leverage huge crowds to do it so what do we do we start with a with a problem that we think is is worth solving and then go about it and the psychology of the incentive challenge is such that historically a lot of these incentive challenges have been such that the amount of effort people put in 
is much greater than the actual prize and especially the collective effort uh, collectively obviously if you've got hundreds or thousands of people participating in some contest there's tons and tons of effort more than there's the reward money for like you couldn't divide that reward money by everybody uh, because then everybody would get like 10 cents for their time uh, even if it's a huge huge million dollar pr prize because there's there could be a lot of teams a lot of a lot of people participating spending a lot of time but the psychology of it is that it turns out people do want to do spend extraordinary amount of time on these kinds of challenges and and the thing is it's like a game it's a it's the human psychology people are some, some call, somewhat competing um, against each other and and that kind of psychology makes people put in much more effort than a reward prize so even you know when when somebody want wins whatever like the car challenge uh, like say wikispeed entered the car challenge to get a hundred mile per gallon car uh, they put x effort uh, the re reward um, well i'm not sure about wikispeed because wikispeed did it on a cheap but but many many teams would put in tons of money like if their reward is one million they'd put put in like five million you know or, or whatever so and of course collectively it adds up to much more than say that one company put in say five million to develop this entry for a prize imagine what happens when you do that collectively so uh, the point I want to mention about the incentive challenge is that if you look at Hero X all the challenges there are pretty much competitive and what would I mean by that so we're here fostering global collaboration but an incentive challenge platform like Hero X is largely competitive meaning that a lot of different teams compete against each other and what we want to do in this in our game is is to shift that rule and to say we're going to reward for collaboration so that means people have to build upon each other's work and collaborate as much as possible so in that process we're going to we're going to incentivize and think about how how we do that how do we incentivize collaboration how do we structure the reward in order to make that happen um, so that's a that's a big deal now when it comes down to the practical practical aspects of this we we get down into the nitty-gritty of what we want to do and for us what we what we would like to do we think that um, framing around self plastic self plastic waste while producing housing so the idea here is that we've been bouncing around for the last few months is incentive challenge on a, on a large size 3d printer that allows you to print from trash resource so that means from the waste stream actually which nobody really does right now it's a it's a problem it's not super hard but definitely there's uh, there's collaboration needed in order to get low-cost equipment and techniques and everything around that that makes it feasible so right now the idea is we've got a large printer the property of that is it has to have an enclo a high temperature build chamber because without such a thing you're reduced to printing just with a few plastics like PLA, um, TPU which is rubber, some of the rubber plastics like ABS even, I mean you can't print ABS meaningfully without a heated chamber even um, layers would delaminate if, if part of a print is cold so, so 3D printing is depositing just, just for the plastic version depositing plastic uh, the heated chamber is much needed when um, because a lot of plastics are so hard to print with that if you don't have a very highly controlled environment they simply delaminate if it's too cold the layers just separate and it doesn't work so right now you cannot print with the most common plastics like like polyethylene polypropylene uh, like even ABS you, you can do a little bit right next to the heated bed but once you come off like say you try to print a very tall thing no way without a heated chamber so completely limited without that and we have to do that and there's no single open source hot chamber out there there's been a prototype done for, for example by the most people of uh, Michigan Tech they did a prototype of a, of a printer that does have a heated chamber but it's not designed to the point where you can do it continuous and and scalable it's not that we've got an idea here and we'll get into the technology here so what we want to cover is here's the idea here's the why here's the technology but there's a few elements here that we have to our advantage that can make this work um, 
we have a design, so this is a concept that I, I'm pretty sure it's a foolproof in terms of how to do it um, using the technology that we have right now at OSE. Uh, so I'll talk about that. Um, the part about the scalable universal axes, that's a very low cost way to get to get CNC motion systems and we're talking now on a scale of 4x4x8 four by four by feet. That's enough to print one of the full size panels for the house. So this is talking about serious, serious product. Now, before you get to this, this printing, if you're going to go from trash, because the deal is one kilo of filament is about twenty dollars, right? So that means if you were to print a house um, which weighs twenty tons, so that's forty thousand. Well, twenty tons is what twenty thousand kilos times twenty. Well right so 20 per kilo if you were to 3d print a house out of plastic um, or you can do like plastic composites with wood like wood dust sawdust which makes it look like actually you're printing what it smells like like wood and looks like wood um, but okay 20 tons what's that 20,000 times 20 four hundred thousand dollars for printing a house. that's the one <laughs> one thousand square foot CD go home there would be about 10 tons of equivalent lumber weight in there uh, that we could displace and pretty much get most of the structure and everything out of waste. But $400,000 is not doable. That's we're, We want to get to more like $4,000, maybe like 100x better than that. And that's you have to go to the waste stream to do that. So waste stream plastic, if you collect it yourself, is free. If you get large bales, like one ton bales from the recycling places, they're going to be like 10 cents a pound or so. You know, so we're, t we're talking now going from uh, $20 per kilogram to like maybe 10 or 20 cents per kilogram. Uh, so a factor of 100x if you go to recycling. So that's, that's an important point. But you have to have the infrastructure to do that. So you need a shredder and you need then a plastic filament maker. Those things we have built already here. We, we know something about that. And the challenge is to reduce the cost of this entire system so you can say perhaps hey invest and and this number is actually has to be technically derived based on here's the available technology we know if we did it in the most efficient way it would cost X I think that number is somewhere between 5 and 10 K for the system so we can say what about this how about for 10 K you can get yourself a new house <laughs> in other words 3d printed so that this is quite ambitious uh, not impossible I think it's I think the problem is such that it would require a number of people to do it especially if you're gonna say we're gonna d use this challenge in a, in a six month probably like a six month development period six to one year um, leverage a lot of contributions something that solvable pretty much readily but it, it's more than any single person can do or like any single company can do it's just too many things to make it work. I mean, pr product R&D is intensive. It's a lot of prototyping. So if you divide it by many, many people, you can, in principle, solve this in a good way. Uh, so that's so we want to throw up an incentive challenge that's impossible by one person. And therefore, you, you demand that collaboration is the way to do it. So you cannot have, say, a, a hundred teams. Okay. So say at the price point of like a hundred thousand dollar incentive challenge, the way it goes, typically it's like about a thousand people show up or so, a thousand teams. Well, if they all worked against each other or didn't collaborate, you're getting one thousandth of the result. I mean, the math is extremely simple, yet not a single contest on Hero X has been done collaboratively. I looked for that and I was blown away to see that all the rules, as, as I mentioned the other days, all the rules are if you borrow from others, you're cheating and you're disqualified which is nonsense. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous. So we have a, a value proposition. Let's say we're collaborating here. Great. So that's, I think that's a good start. And also, but a lot of this, it's, it's really about creating collaborative culture, right? So we're doing something a little different. And I think that is the value we can provide to the world because as we do this, people will, will, will look at this and, and we want to set an example for more people to follow this because uh, why shouldn't everything be collaborative like that? Even the incentive challenges, which you think 
would be for the common good. It's like, it's so obvious, yet it does not happen in today's world, which is, I mean, to me personally, I, it's like, wow, that's just amazing. Amazingly backwards, and at the same time, an absolutely amazing opportunity. So that's the way I see it. Um, so, on a technical front, I think at OSE we're the best positioned out of anybody else in the world as far as doing low-cost technology that's industrial grade. And that's where we can leverage and we can leverage the collaborative development. I would also like to see the inclusion. If, if OSE is going to put up 100K, we can get some more people to put up some more money. Let's do it. Uh, I think the, the problem statement is good enough. It says we're going to solve the plastic waste problem. That's a possible outcome. It's not impossible. It's, there's so much volume of waste that's generated, and specifically, that's 300 million, divided by two, 300 million tons is the annual plastic production, people. That's a global figure. Half of that ends up in the waste stream, probably across the earth and in the oceans. Well, a lot of landfills. It's waste. What happens to it? Uh, some of it may be recycled. I don't, I don't know what percentage is recycled. I'm not sure. I don't think it's a lot uh, altogether. So, 150 million tons. 10, per, uh, 10 tons per house gets you 15 million houses worldwide. You could solve the plastic problem for that with that that'd be great and make houses that are affordable low cost lower cost than anything else so huge opportunity we can say we're we are solving the plastic problem now one single person is not going to solve the plastic problem this has to be distributed and global worldwide and technology has to be accessible low cost enough that this can spread widely widely that's the requirement we have to optimize it to the point. So, so the problem statement is simple. Let's optimize this system. And if we look at the actual components, we can we can say this this is the price of a system that starts with a bale of trash, and which produces your building panels. We could even say something like the challenge may be like so. We have to be very clear on defining goals. What is the winning entry? Maybe it's an actual house that's been produced by this printer that's that's your that's that's big imagine up here we're developing this whole thing and it's not just that machine because you might question well what can it do well how about we make it even the house itself we want to relate this to the cd eco home we do plan on making our own lumber trim and stuff uh, going forward but why not leverage the entire world to help us on that yeah that that sounds good and then you have to look at some of the practicalities how long would it take to print one of these houses well uh, the current rates using existing open source extruders you get 20 pounds per hour uh, not per hour, 20 pounds per day for 24 hours so that's the super volcano nozzles and super volcano heater blocks they are open source you can actually do that and we can increase that a little bit we can probably get to you know, to more than that, but multiple print heads would solve that. So you have a printer that the the solution would probably have to be multiple print head, so that you've got one machine with multiple heads that that does it. So you're not printing one panel at a time. You might be printing like four or eight at a time. Maybe just plain replicas. That's that's feasible. But four or eight. So let's let's say we get to four. Uh, four would be, I think, rather easy. Eight is. Eight, I think, is quite doable. It's n not major technical challenges for getting eight print heads on a on a big printer. Um, but let's say we get to eight times twenty. We can probably optimize the twenty to more like forty, possibly. I don't. See, there's no technical reason that says you can't. Um, so let's say we get eight heads times forty, three hundred twenty pounds per day. So how long would it take to print a house? Ooh, this is getting interesting because the numbers are starting to add up. Each panel weighs weighs 100 to 200 pounds. So you've got 
maybe two panels a day even uh, at that rate. So if the house, right now, the shell of the house, the exterior walls, there's 48 wall panels. There's 21 interior wall panels and then there's rest like roof and, and floor and other things. So you can say like the equivalent of about 100. Mmm, 50 days. <laughs> that would be that would be good. That the numbers do add up. So this is not a far-fetched thing. The num the, the amount of plastic that's out there in the waste stream is is huge, and also the the productivity of a printer like this could be quite good. And then some of the challenges are okay. Let's make this a multiple print head. Let's do the the challenges. The heated chamber technology. Um, as far as extrusion technology, I mean that's pretty much a done deal. The way we do things, we can actually scale the 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 heater blocks in order to to make higher extrusion happen uh, that's something we can readily do here so we can absolutely have no problem on a frame on a motion system on an extrusion system the challenge is that the things we have not done are simply the high high temperature chamber but i don't see technical issues on that there's a design and I'll, i will get into that because i think that's one of the most core components that plus a low-cost shredder so how do you get to a low-cost shredder? You need some blades uh, to do it. You could do it, the, the cheapest motor out there you can do that with is actually a, a treadmill motor that costs 50 bucks and it's quite re replicable um, <laughs> for three horsepower or five horsepower at $50. You can't do better than that for any kind of motor. Uh, that's just one thing. For the shredder blades, I mean, possibly include the torch table as a way to get there a simple torch table that could perhaps be a bootstrap machine you've got this printer that you're making but say you want to replicate this machine uh, at scale if you have one of maybe if you have a torch table you can do it very inexpensively but what if what if perhaps I mean one one consideration could be can we actually include the torch table as part of the infrastructure that's required here because that's what's going to get you the whole system at rock bottom price like say the shredder blades or other components for the system so you can think think like that or think about here's a part of this challenge that's how do you make this large machine at ridiculously low cost well I could tell you one price reduction like if it's uh, like each bushing on the one inch universal axis costs I mean right now it costs five dollars but there's 20 of them you know that's a hundred that's not too much but uh, but you can also think about okay here's the you know, how about if some of the components of the entire system are also from waste plastic so so the, the system would be a bootstrapping system where you can do a smaller printer just to get you some of the parts from trash so you're starting with bootstrapping this this plastic recycling to build to get to the actual thing so technically you can think about a lot of creative ways to to solve this problem if you want to do something at a very low cost uh, but it's a very interesting problem because uh, I mean if the fruit is cleaning up plastic waste and then maybe by the the kind of collaborative protocols that we develop here we can make this a pattern for more people and then uh, the thinking here is this kind of thinking gets us to um, I mean really like this is like about transcending artificial scarcity here that like pretty high up the goals of OSE uh, if we create a new pattern for doing this, like s actually show that collaborative development can do something like this. So I think on many fronts this is this is quite interesting and, and could produce uh, cultural change and tangible results at the same time. So very much worth doing. And that's why I'm saying, okay, right now I'm going to drop 100k on this uh, from OSC resources. I want to do this. I want to see this happen and open it up to the whole world and see if a bold call to for collaboration could get more resources in terms of prize money uh, in terms of hero x the platform there, there's a charge for that platform too so and we're thinking about using it and they charge like 10 percent so like if we have a prize if we collect say up to a quarter million quarter million sounds good that's that sounds like something considerable um well, the charge for that would be the, the service charge from HeroX would be probably like 25k or some, something like that. Um, not sure about the details, but these are all the due diligence we, we need to consider. And what about a, a strategy such as we're, we're getting conditional commitments. We're saying maybe we could go, if we get to the 250k, that's when everyone gets to pay in.
you know, the, the conditional acceptance. We say we're, we're following, we're pursuing this goal. Once we can collect enough support, we're going to do it. So we can, we can frame it that way. So it's a, it mitigates risk. It says that, okay, we have enough resources to make this go forward well and incentivize a lot of people and people are more willing to collaborate. And throughout this process, invariably, we're going to run into a lot of interesting people, uh, collaborators. This is a, a huge publicity thing, too. I mean, to do something like this will we'll get you into media. So I think this it's quite exciting. And maybe um, so today what we wanted to do on this is actually, so one, get into the some of the technical aspects and talk about all the other resources that are required to do this. So, I mean, what are some of the resources? There's going to be a promo video for this. There's going to be marketing copy here. Here, Here's the, what the world hears. Uh, here's our posting, actually, on the incentive challenge. There's going to be reward structure. Okay, how do you actually grade the entries? From the get-go, I could see things like... So this is going to be, once again, the cultural shift will be... Some of the rules might be free CAD uploads, uploads, downloads, like you get rewarded for how much you upload and download, how much you upload into the design and how much you actually build upon other people's work by downloading and then re-uploading. Uh, we can track that through time logs on a wiki or through simple commit logs on a wiki. So there's a whole, a uh, whole, um, what do you say, uh, algorithm for how we would grade the, the actual entries, but it has to incentivize the fact that we're collaborating and Probably something like a grand prize with s many small uh, secondary prizes. Because the thing is, we um, probably wouldn't be, may or may not be wise to say, oh, we're going to divide the reward money simply by how much people contributed. I don't know. Uh, we have to think about the psychology of that and maybe kind of vet that. But typically what happens in these challenges is you get this grand prize and, and a few smaller ones. And that's, that's enough for a lot of people to contribute. Uh, another part of the psychology there is um, when people contribute, they're saying, okay, ideally we would create some, some kind of psychology that says, I'm going to contribute even if I don't win because I know we're going to win together. Man, if we could create that, how do you structure that? What are the rules for that? That's the question we want to answer. I would propose we launch this uh, perhaps, and I would open it up to the crowd here, but I'm, I'm thinking, so we need a few months to prepare this. We wanted to do the Saturdays on all these collaborative, global collaborative protocols, so, so we're going to continue this every Saturday for the next six months. Um, so that sounds like we should probably launch in six months. Um, we do need some time to prepare, and when, so when we launch, we have a, a solid offer, some good videos, like maybe an apprenticeship right now, we are going to be building the large printers. In the Summer X, we're going to be building the large printers and shredders, the high temperature chamber, yes. So we can be feeding all that through the process, saying, okay, hey people, we've got this already, build upon it. I think uh, the idea of admissible parts is a good idea to focus people on, okay, this is what we know works, so you get people onboarded rapidly for what are the best practices, all the knowledge that, you know, that we know about this problem. That means large high temperature printers, shredding and recycling. Get all the knowledge in the world collecting, collecting around this. So I think uh, there's a lot of possibility. Um, and definitely, since nobody's done it to date, uh, it's a problem bigger than a small group or even a company can do. So uh, from here, I just want to like technically why why I feel pretty good about the possibility here is is the two technologies that we do have are the universal axes right now and the high temperature chamber which as I mentioned the motion systems do exist in the open source people make various versions I think the universal axis is the I mean humbly speaking the best there is I don't see anything else that's as scalable in size or simple to make in terms of part count I mean I study this thing that's and I and I would actually venture to say that uh, a system like the universal axis would be 
is degenerate. What do I mean by that? Degenerate means that if you have the requirements of highest performance and lowest cost and some of the other features, modularity, scalability, you're going to get something that looks like that. So, I mean, I, I can pretty much guarantee you that. Uh, so it's degenerate design. We're saying th these are some of the best practices that we reduce to because we know they work and we can vet that too. It's like part of the challenge could be, okay, can you devise a better universal access system, meaning a, a general purpose XYZ and rotary motion CNC system? Well, we think we've got that. We, we're On our system, we're also using ramps, just simple you know, $20 board to control the entire system. That's what we can do for the entire printer just put external stepper drivers which allow you to drive any size stepper motors for whatever size of 3D printer or device that you need so that the controller technology is completely open source universal axes are completely open source the ability to make frames at scale that's open source now that so the challenge comes into the, the heated chamber and the shredding and the filament making infrastructure uh, I also know, so, so on the filament making, uh, there's people working on it. I mean, I, I like to talk about Michigan Tech Lab people, so Josh, Joshua Pierce there, because he's actually working on, on extruder screws that are DIY open source. Actually, uh, they are open source CNC grinder that actually makes them. That's not out yet, it's, it's common. But, you know, it's, problems here are not, not super challenging. They're, they're good. They're just, I think, at the right, right complexity level that lends itself to large development. Um, I do want to talk about the, the chamber, the, the high temperature chamber, uh, just so you can get the, the understanding of what's involved and what problem we have to solve. Uh, because that's, yeah, well, so we, we'd like to, today what we want to do is break into different groups and work, okay, here's the technical group that will assess and define here's what we think, like ultimately it's going to be, I think, price point. Here's, we know the technology that works here, we know how much it costs, what it can do, that you can define in an engineering sense. And then we say, uh, after a very careful analysis of that, in a technical group here, we can say, this is what we expect as the price point, based simply on the amount of materials we're using, the technologies we're using, you can be very rigorous in defining that and I think that's the value where we can produce here we have studied the system and we know this is possible and that's something we can refine and get vetted so that when we put this out to the world they say wow this is gonna work so this is this is where you need a lot of feedback loops and get everybody at the universities involved get open source simulations involved and everything else so, pretty good. We'll break into the technical group, maybe the publicity and, and marketing and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I think there's business development on this where, okay, here's the actual model of how much you're producing, what the costs are, etc. There's posting the incentive challenge, there's video, like let's come up with a video script. Uh, so, various assets that are required. So. Um, I'll, I'll um, maybe continue for about 20 more minutes on what all we could do and then I'd like to break down into groups and start a, a working doc. So once again, the industry standard here, we're a collaborative working doc, we can say here's the breakdown of the roles, here's the different elements we have to solve for and maybe attach some people to it as we go along and, and for today uh, go off and work on it collaboratively. Uh, so for now, I, I want to get into the actual high temperature chamber technology and I want to explain that really briefly um, so that you appreciate something that doesn't exist because nobody's done it. I mean, the problem statement is this. It's in a high temperature chamber, you've got a nozzle with a, with a stepper motor typically. You've got this thing where you need about up to the high temperature chambers need to go to for the super high performance printer probably up to close to 200 celsius the problem with that is that at that kind of temperature you're melting your electronics and other structures if they're if they're not steel 
So you're melting things like the, the windings within the stepper motors. The stepper motors are rated only for 60C, typically. So you cannot put any of your sensitive elements within the hot temperature area. So the problem statement is rather simple. Keep everything out of the heat except for the tip of the nozzle. That's what it boils down to. Other people try to do clever things like, oh yeah, throw that in there and maybe cool parts of it, water. Great, sure. That's complicated. Just keep everything that's sensitive out of that chamber. Start with that idea and solve for that because that's a robust design. Can't beat it. Simplest solution to this problem of frying things in a hot... Basically, think about an oven. you got to keep your sensitive things out of the oven. It's a, um, so we know right now we can, we can do this. I think there's a good way to do this. Uh, so I'll describe what, what we can do. So idea is you've got your high temperature chamber. It's insulated and you have a shield on top, very simply. Uh, the head moves with the shield and it's an enclosed at the top. So uh, I have a diagram of this, so I, I want to show this. So it's, um, let me share my screen. This is called, on a wiki, you can search for high temperature. What are we going to find? High temperature. Heated bed. Sure, high temperature heated enclosure. So, uh, here's a diagram of the idea. You have a hot, the red stuff is the hot chamber. You have, so the universal axis on top, Y axis, Z axis. There's a build plate, the, the Z axis has to go up and down. So the problem is if you're moving in three dimensional motion, how do you get all those motion systems out of that hot area? Well, in this diagram, you see that definitely the X and Y, which are on top, the, the, the carriage, uh, this should say carriage. carriage. X. X. That's the X axis. Call that where the extruder rides on the X axis back and forth. You got the Y axis, which means goes in and out of the page. So you've got 2D right there. There's two dimensional motion X Y. That, if you separate, that would be easy to to do like two dimensional drawings where you know you're just drawing on a on a high temperature surface. Uh, but here you got to go up in Z. So. The way we, we do that here, what we do is we're attaching this, see this red thing here? That's a guard, that's simply a guard attached to the carriage. It's attached right to the carriage. All that sticks out is the nozzle tip. So you're riding on top of this heated chamber. There's a meshing contact between that guard and the top of the chamber. That's it. Now, okay, what about how do we address the z-axis? So in our usual 3D printers, we have the z-axis bed that moves up and down in the z-direction. The axes on that, you have to now penetrate through the enclosure. So what I see here is you have a one or two, like if it's the universal axis, which we typically support on two rods, just cut two slots or even like make it one rod um, and make, that, make a vertical slit in that hot temperature chamber Put some wipers around that soft material, like maybe carbon fiber blanket or uh, something like fiberglass that wipes against that uh, the rods that are sticking into the chamber so that you get temperature enclosure. You can definitely heat the chamber. You can put heaters inside there. Uh, so the limit to this system here is Dep depends on what the material for that wiper at the top is. I was thinking for a lightweight transparent one, you can actually use PEI, which is what we use on the print bed surface right now. That material is good for up to 167C continuous. So right there, if we do that, we have the technology to create a high temperature chamber for 167C. And I think that's, that's, more, I think that's enough. Um, I don't think we need to go higher than that. What you need to do is for proper print bed adhesion is you have to be below the melting temperature 
of the plastic. I think 167 for ambient temperature can probably get us there. And if you set up some thermal gradients such as the heater being at the, the bottom, convection makes heat go up. So it's a little cooler at the top so you can have the print area pretty hot. Now because the, the, the guard, the red guard there, uh, the red closure is against ambient temperature on the other side. It's, you know, one, one side might be quite hot, the other side will be cooler. So this could probably not only get you like 167, it might get you 10 or 20 degrees even higher because it's getting cooled from the top just by ambient temperature. So, and, and the thickness of that is like 0.1 of an inch or 0.05 or so of an inch. It's standard. This is already stuff we're using already. So I have experience with this. We, we have a lot of experience with this. Uh, so you can cut out a sheet like that. Now, the challenges here are if you have this big guard closing this chamber, yeah, you have to have a large enough frame so that this, this guard does not hit the sides. Well, not a problem. We've got the capacity to make as large universal axes and frames as we want. So I don't see this costing $150,000 or more like a comparable printer. <laughs> Uh, this could cost us about 5k or so for a large for a large one for a small one you know maybe a $500 above our ticket price right now it's so you're talking about an insulated heated chamber probably take take plates of steel put some insulation in that build it around weld it around or, or <coughs> do, some, do some other comparable mechanism so does anyone have any questions on this, uh, just technically speaking? Because I think this is kind of like, this right here does not exist in the open source, and you're going to pay tens of thousands of dollars for this right here. Let's solve this. This allows you to print with any plastic in the world. You can now start shredding your plastic bags and anything, which you can't print with right now, because they're, they're polyethylene, it's too hard to print, delaminates, and won't stick to your bed. Here you can. Just by again temperature, the build plate hot enough, it'll stick, and you can still <coughs> use PEI as the as the basic substrate. Uh, get it hot enough, it will stick. You have to control the temperature. That's fine. We've got temperature controls, open source. That's Marlin and Ramps. That's fine. Not a problem. So there we go. Any questions on this? Does this make sense, or or like, um, do, is there like a type one error on this that this somehow is flawed in concept because we start this with this concept and then we go about implementing it uh, I mean this is obvious and simple in my view <clears throat> yet nobody's like like the people I've seen do this uh, the common thing is they've got these bellow shaped things that fold on top like a bellows that that would fold on top great I mean why the complexity that's there's patents on that they I think expired already but that's too complicated. Just do a simple sheet. Just make it right on top. What's the big deal here? I don't know. Uh, I don't see any problem with that. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, and just and other people are saying, oh, we're going to go into, we're going to actually put some of these hot stepper motors inside the chamber and we're just going to run water through that. Great, but why all the extra complexity? Okay. Uh, Matt, is that you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so and this is on, you know, Go ahead. um, but so, so what you're describing that seems pretty straightforward to you, the, then the, the question that I'm, I'm unclear on, uh, kind of what would people be trying to figure out for this competition? Like, like just building this, like according to what you've described or are there, are there still tons of questions about implementation? Cause it seems like you have a clear view of how this could be implemented. So, see what I'm asking? Yeah, I see what you're asking. And I think the answer is, one, communicate it effectively. That's all. That's called graphics and media and PR. Get enough people to show up, make a compelling case for this. But second, we have not built this yet. We will yeah. in the summer. But I mentioned the other day that you need a hundred or a thousand iterations before it works to uh, the best product in the world. That's where we need the collaboration. So yes, we will build it. It might work. It will work. Will be robust, not on the first try. You want to get to robustness. That means you turn it on, it prints and always prints and you never ever have to mess with it. 
it's easy to maintain and all those properties. So does that answer the question? Yeah, so, so we're looking for people who will try to build this and then refine the, refine it as needed until it's kind of as robust yeah. as... Yes, yeah, so, so there's two phases. One is actually posting this challenge. So posting this challenge is effectively a communications question. This is writing and media, video, so forth. We can do some of that here. And maybe we can get collaborators remotely that can help us on that. So we can actually feed assets like, okay, so in a promo video of this, you see, okay, and now you can use this universal access. You can make this big thing. We've already done maybe like we just prototyped the small heater chamber. Now we're going to size it up. So, I mean, we're going to feed as much resource into that, make as compelling a case that this is doable. And now you can build yourself an entire CD go home for $10,000 by building this 3D printer and cleaning up the environment. Thank you. Participate. And we have to think about what the role division is. How do people participate in this? We have to talk, talk about... Here's the role breakdown structure, the collaboration architecture. Like how, if you've got one skill, what can you do? Uh, I think a lot of that would be, of course, here's the development of the actual machines, but let's make it even bigger. Let's, let's, do, let's say we're actually developing a commercially viable way to produce this. So there's business development. Let's make this into a product. The idea here is extreme enterprise. This is... Uh, we're collaboratively developing the product, but product is different than enterprise. Product is, or even project, like this project, product, and enterprise. A project is not a product. If you've got a product, you don't necessarily have, prototype, have an enterprise, like a refined enterprise. Like right now, we can sell the 3D printers it's somewhat enterprise level, but to take it to, okay, now we're like actually making a lot of money and many people are doing the same around the world. That's what I mean. That's when the enterprise has been developed. So we, we're going to try to push the world towards that, saying that, okay, here's not only the, the device, but here's the, the dissemination of it. So training materials, perhaps training problems. And the question is, how much of that do we throw under the bus here <laughs> in terms of putting that into the challenge? We have to say, okay, this is what we want in a challenge and make it realistic so that it's actually doable right so maybe we decide oh well maybe just leave it at the technology i'd like to leave it at the product where it's not it's not only that it works somewhat robustly and of course you always iterate and you keep going and keep evolving this but uh the case would be it works well <coughs> that would be like the minimum but I'd like to see an enterprise around it, a distributive enterprise, meaning we're actually producing assets of education so that all the people here go to, to their parts of the world and start this enterprise or, every, or many other people do that. Or we, we train more people. Like next year, we, we're starting to train people to actually build these franchises out like Boxable. So actually, uh, <laughs> right? So you guys heard about it. So. Um, Right, box. Look, you know, Boxable. That's a franchise for for this house that's actually competitive with us. It's they're close to us in price, actually. So they're going to cost about two hundred k. I looked at their numbers, and uh, they have a small micro house that they're creating a worldwide franchise about uh, that costs fifty thousand dollars for three hundred seventy five square feet but that doesn't include foundation, installation, transportation of that thing to your place. So I think at the end of the day, I kind of went through the numbers. It's going to be a minimum of one seventy dollars to $200,000. So it's around our price point. We're saying hundred k for us without the land. So they're close. They're, I like it because they're just becoming efficient. They basically say that. They're uh, like Wes um, talking about that. Boxable. They're uh, they're efficient. I looked at their stuff. They're they're saying, yeah, we just you know they're just optimizing, you know, because uh, housing is super inefficient. That's it's that's the that's the real uh, advantage there. Uh, house house building today is very inefficient and very wasteful in terms of material use and uh, various things. 
um, the, basically stemming from the, the fact that the designer is not the, the engineer is not the designer, designer is not the builder, the builder is not the user, the user is not the service person, stuff like that. Um, a lot of that break and, and the way that things work and financing and all that adds up to a high cost of housing. So the concept for the heated built chamber is it's there. Uh, for the regarding the actual technology of grinding, there's, I think there's a lot of creativity we can put our heads around with that. I think there's there's a lot of work. The way you can reduce that price is being very effective about it, and you can do things like 3D printed belts if you want a super low cost gear down. TPU does exist, and it's an amazing material thermoplastic urethane which which is rubber we've printed some prototype belts here uh, you can think about how do you make that device super low cost imagine like a, what I see here is if you have access to low cost plastic through a bootstrap plastic operation then you can get the entire infrastructure for this life-size system that produces house panels at very minimal cost like for the shredder you can get it to near free minus the motor is going to cost you fifty dollars for three horsepower but that's enough for industrial grade for like probably like a thousand or so pounds of grind per day uh, at least you can do 3d printed bearings so any electromechanical devices a motor shaft couplers bearings bearings we have prototype here you can take commercial balls which cost only a few cents and you can create the 3d structure for a high high force bearing uh, otherwise a bearing like that is 75 dollars each so this is like where the costs are adding up you start looking at here's each element let's 3d print that from waste plastic and add a little bit of metal to it and you've got a high power device at low cost so the bearings we can nail the belts we can nail, the motor is $50, and for the actual rotor, how about metal tip inserts so that into a large plastic st rotor structure? Like That's one way I can see, because the blades are going to cost a bit, you know, if you go on industrial grade, you got to CNC cut them. What if it's just we're, pr we're doing the tips, like insertable tooth blades, like on some sawmills and things like that, insertable teeth, replaceable teeth, that just the tooth is the high performance metal, abrasion resistant metal, the rest is plastic you know so you can talk about a lot of different tricks to to make this low cost and if we get all the brains around the world on it we can we can do well so maybe we want to yeah any so any other questions on like the concept here is that uh what do you guys think about this can we do it well, I have a conceptual question yeah which is that the goal is to be able to melt existing plastic, like shred it, melt it, and then yeah. turn it into filament. Um, is the heated enclosure only needed for this and not at all for these printers? Like it's needed for everything. For The oh. point about the heated enclosure is that you can only print with some select low temperature, lower temperature plastics. You cannot print with any high temperature plastics because when it's at ambient temperature or not high enough, like the higher the temperature, the higher you need the enclosure. Otherwise, the you, the layers don't stick. Oh, so it's, is it durability, like uh, higher temperature plastics? Like right now, this 3D printer doesn't print with. Higher it's not a high performance printer. Yeah. It's a uh, it's just your. Um, it's not hobby because we produce large parts on it. Sure. But it's not industrial grade or high performance in the sense of printing with high temperature plastics. Like for example. There's PEI, which is actually the bed surface, which we use on the, the heated bed. Yeah. You can actually print with that. That's a thermoplastic, but not on this printer. Sure. Um, so you can actually do things like, with that high temperature printer, you can now go back to the scrap stream of PEI and get that print surface, which otherwise would be like a hundred or a couple of hundred bucks. So things like that. Um, but yeah, you, you need it for anything. Like right now, that's why, I'm, that's the that's the point I'm trying to make right now 3d printing in an open source is in a stone age we came out of, we we had the major breakthrough about 2011 or 12 when when the RepRap project came out and the first 3d printers became a reality that were open source 
So you didn't have to pay 10000 for a printer. You can build one for like 500 bucks. We got to take this to the next step, and that is the high temperature chamber and large size printers that work. So you're opening up to, like, and the other thing is uh, plastics are not necessarily like super high temperature. It's like polyethylene. It will not stick to itself in, in the ambient temperature. You cannot print with it. It won't stick to your bed. It won't stick to yourself, to itself. The way that the 3D printers work, when you extrude the plastic, it actually melts the layer below it. That's how it works. Okay. If you don't have a high enough temperature in the ambient, or plastic doesn't melt at a low enough temperature, the layers will not stick. So that's, that's the problem we're solving for, the high temperature thing. And that means you can print with anything here, like, I want to see this place as quickly as possible. Stop throwing away plastic. It's all valuable resource. We're throwing it into the waste stream right now. Uh, we can be pr processing everything, every single part here, this, your old cell phone that you shred and get the plastic out and separate the metal and all the bottles, everything. So you've got, now you've killed off the waste plastic issue, which is like half a trash. The organics you can all co compost. Any metals you shred and reuse and remelt. With, that's our next problem statement in a year or two with the induction furnace. Right now we're at the level of, let's solve plastic. Does that answer it? Yeah. Yeah. Will it be able to melt like everything together or do we need to sort it first? The second part of that is there's both. There's certain plastics that completely are miscible and blendable. Others are not. So part of this would be developing formulas. So certainly if you have a single, uh, single trash bell, they typically separate them for you already or you can separate it yourself if you're collecting it yourself. So if you're doing a single plastic, that means any plastic, any thermal plastic, not thermal set. Uh, but now if you start mixing, you just got to pay attention. You have to know which ones you've mixed so that you know they're going to stick together. Or you can say, oh, I've just, just got a little bit of this other plastic, like a little ball of it in this, in this big bell. It won't matter, right? So there's strategies of how you do that. And then with, when you're printing with large nozzles, it doesn't matter that the plastic is, is dirty um, because all the dirt will go right through the nozzle. It's only when you're printing with a small hobby printers with like 0.4 and under nozzles, any little dirt in there will clog your nozzle. So here we're talking about nozzles that are at least 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8 .1 millimeters, probably 1.8 millimeter and up rather. Right now we're printing at 1.2 millimeters as our standard for our printers because it's fast the, the prints are super strong the the, the bigger the the, no, the nozzle the bigger the filament diameter that you extrude the stronger the prints because more surface area bonds to itself as opposed to a very thin thin string being deposited on a on the next layer the, the the thicker it is the more heat it has so it can melt the layer below it better and it, it it's much stronger prints so actually our prints, even though they're pretty ugly, they're actually much stronger than typical prints. Yeah. So there's a whole thing about material science and developing blends, like what blends well with each other. Uh, that's a whole productization part. Okay, here's how. Here's a process for taking for going to your cafeteria and making uh, cafeteria tables from your trash or whatever. You know. So, yeah. Um. For piston type movement. For piston movement. type movement for, for the bed. For the bed? Yeah, then you don't have to have holes in the sides. You can try it. But um Maybe the limits a, yeah. yeah, it's an option, but if you talk about yeah, you're gonna have to have seals and pistons which are if you have pistons you would have an air or hydraulic system. It might be doable. I don't see that being done as as cleanly because you need to penetrate somewhere anyway. I know that for hydraulics you can only go to 180, about 180, that's not C, that's Fahrenheit. So what is that, like 80 C, that's not high enough, you're going to melt your cylinder seals. So won't do for hydraulics if you have the hydraulics inside the chamber. No, no, just outside, just to push the... To push the yeah. 
If it's easier, but I, I, if we can show that that's easier than two stepper motors and metal rods penetrating the chamber. Uh, in the metal rods penetrating the chamber, uh, it's not technically complex. You can have wipers around the rods. Uh, recently I ran into, we use carbon fiber blanket. That's a really nice material. That's like 2000 Celsius melting point. Uh, like really high, that's like welding blanket, carbon fiber. Uh, that's a great wiper, for example. So I don't think that that's too difficult to do. You could do a single rod, like a you say a one inch or even, or like a more of a vertical rod on a z-axis. So it cuts through that slit, and it's only a, I would do that. It's a single rod. You're going up through a slit in a high temperature chamber. So you've got two penetrant, two linear slits in a high temperature chamber that go up the side. Not, not difficult. I don't see that we can do better price-wise. We can consider it. We can definitely evaluate, okay, here's the actual cost. Because with that, you're going to have to have a compressor or hydraulic system, which would add a bit of cost. Unless, unless we say, oh, this is a system you can run off a tractor, for example, or something like that. Uh, we want to make it as accessible as possible so if it meets our criteria of transparent, collaborative, open, re scalable, replicable, we can definitely look at it. And that could be a technical point. That would definitely actually be good as a point, hey, we've evaluated the hydraulic system. This is the lowest cost and performance we could get out of that. It's primarily going to boil down to cost and complexity of the system. So you're adding another system. We already have stepper motors. Like when you add another system, that's more complexity. But what if, what if we end up doing the shredder on hydraulics or something? I don't know. But I, I see the electrical systems at this scale, like with the... Uh, actually the treader mill motors that's the lowest cost motor for the power you can get right now and they're only fifty dollars for like three horsepower three or four so I don't think we can do better than that for comparison. and the stepper motors they're like fifty bucks at the level each for at the level we probably want uh, I could see the bed getting heavy so the the counterweight mechanism like we use in our larger printer that would be effective yeah um, yeah any other questions? Are the wipers also high temperature? Like, they yeah, they, they would be. What are they made of? So I mentioned the carbon fiber blanket, which is uh, over 1,000 Celsius. It's, or fiber, carbon, not carbon fiber, but, but glass fiber, so fiberglass. Okay. Yeah, there's soft materials that are high temperature for wipers like that. Uh, and in a, let's see, in a, the high temperature the design there, what I do about that, uh, I didn't do much there. But there's also some, let's think about what's the chamber like, do you do like fire brick? No, I said just let's do just metal and put some fiberglass or, or uh, more like rock wool in it, which is higher temperature than, well, this is not high enough for, for um, just plain fiberglass, just plain cheap fiberglass that we use in our house insulation that would be perfect for the actual insulation on a high temperature chamber that's only up to like say 200 C so you only need like the, the restriction here is 200 C uh, but the thing is that your electronics don't go more than like 60 or so like a stepper motor at 60 it's kind of the limit uh, and, of, and as I said you can, you can cool them but that's a whole other complexity just keep it out simplest just think about the simplest solution uh, from the start uh, and I don't see any technical reasons why this this w the simplest would not work you typically want to ask okay what's the simplest then you ask does it work because if it doesn't work you have to add more complexity add add more like Einstein says make it as simple as possible but no simpler May I ask one more yeah. question? Like, sure. Expectation that the uh, top plate is going to be twice as big as the chamber because it would be yeah. equal for you to move. Okay. Yeah, exactly, so exactly. Everything else, like the x-axis rod, is also going to be twice as exactly big. And so, if you wanted to print something, you know, this is quite a big printer for, for a consumer yep. point of view. This would be, it would be twice as big. To yes. The same volume size. Okay. That's exactly right. So, okay. so that's the part that's that's not convenient but it's not too expensive it's, it's just a little more metal 
Yeah, I mean, I've seen industrial 3D printers. It's not out of the realm of possibility to have like a room sized yes. industrial printer. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good point because you, you uh, as Paul pointed out, if you're closing the chamber with the, the simplest, simplest mechanism, which is just a, a, piece, a sheet attached to the carriage on the x-axis, then in order to cover the entire chamber in all places, that, that closure has to be twice the size of the chamber. So yes, and that means your frame is going to be correspondingly larger. So this is now getting into the details, but this is, this is structure and we're scalable on structure. So that's not a big issue. It's linearly scalable on structure. Like we don't end up costing like non-linearly more expensive because it's larger, like typically happens in industry. We've got scalable techniques. Scalable means that the price pretty much goes up linearly, not exponentially. We have that. Any other questions from remote? If not, let's continue. So um, we have one person, David, who actually seeded like uh, the, the templates that we, we were talking about. So let's actually get into templates, documents that we start editing and dividing up roles. So on recent wiki changes, there's uh, uh, go down to 120 design lessons, day three. So they actually, uh, David just put this thing up. Uh, it's not seated with documents here because we don't really have assets for day three, but let's put a document in there that would be, um, oh, that's okay, yeah. I'll start a doc. Let's start a doc and put it in there, which we typically work off just a simple template. So let's, let's share a doc. And now let's try this. Let's try it. Once again, we want to get to the point where all of us are collaboratively editing a single doc. Have a mouse, make it easy for yourself. Uh, let's all edit a doc and, and contribute to it. So let's try that. I want to practice this like as much as we can because the power of this is getting massive, massive results collaboratively, real time, like all the information being caught and developed at the same time if people know how to work this process. So the why is, is significant. We can get to transcendent <laughs> levels of collaborative development if we know this very basic uh, capacity, which is many, many people collaborating on a, on a dock, but you have to know something about how you break it down so people don't step on each other's toes and all of that, especially if a cat is involved. So there's some knowledge required to do that, but let's practice it at the simplest level here, which is uh, just collaborative edit of a dock. So let's, let's make, a, make a copy. So we call this the challenge. It's an incentive challenge. What do we call it? We call it clean up the planet incentive challenge. <laughs> I don't know. Let's call it a clean, clean up waste plastic. A lot of people use that term. A lot of people are talking about clean up waste plastic. We can come up with something better if you like, but Converting, convert, convert garbage into money, or like, monetize, I don't know, convert garbage into housing, like that, or whatever. Well, everyone likes money, but <laughs> it, may, it may market better if it's convert garbage into housing. So let's open up this chat box. The chat box I just pasted this thing. Um, the working doc, which I'm going to embed right now into the page, which is called uh, 120 Design Lessons. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll send the link for that. What I do is I embed the doc, so you just put the link to it in there and and then you p go into file, publish to the web, embed. 
publish and get you the HTML for embedding it. So I just embedded this, save changes. So uh, you can click edit on the doc. So this is where it is. This is our day three notes. Look in the chat box. So now we're click edit in there. Okay, I see a bunch of people, five five people in there. So it's not the C B press. This is gonna be the incentive challenge. What are some of the assets we're gonna need? Uh, first of all, when we do this, you want to start with prior work. So what is prior work? There's a bunch of stuff on this. We have a bunch of thoughts on this under incentive challenge on the wiki. I want to see incentive challenge 2021. So look at all that prior work. These were the thoughts from before. We were originally starting to think about a cordless drill challenge, but then COVID hit and we thought, nah, that's not big enough. Let's solve bigger problems. So there's some notes right there already. Take a look at that link. So what are the assets we're gonna generate? And we wanna say, here's the assets and Here's um, who's going to work on it today. So today is a real working session. We're actually doing this. We're collaborating. We're going to start working on here's the things that are required. And let's put a little bit of time and go at it till five. Spend all day on it. Um, some of the things are I want to, <laughs> okay, edit this, people. Let's get everybody take a line, start a line. I want to say I want to get 250000 more money. I mentioned two. Uh, Sweet quarter million. So that means sponsors. Uh, we need a video. Okay, people type in. Type in some of the things we talked about. Promo video. I think it's beyond. Ah! Yeah. I am so sorry. Public edit. Please go in there again. R refresh and uh, start editing. Uh, promo video we definitely need now with that comes a video script um, now this video is something we can work on so collect our assets uh, throughout the program get the cameras out there and w when we're building some of the larger printers like this is gonna be in the next month when we build a printer and build a torch table and shredders and things we'll get that capture that and edit it that's gonna be our assets but we need a video script we need video assets There we go. 650k, about $250. Yeah, let's do that. That's better. We'll get more people. There's going to be um, judging criteria. Let's go th around the table here. So, people, what do you want to, what can you contribute? good at uh, putting together anything to do with uh, uh, marketing. I, could, I mean, I feel like I can communicate things to give me time to write. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to spend the time writing some, we would call this write, copywriting? Okay. Or like what? Technical writing, copywriting. Um, so what do you need to do that? Uh, I mean, just to be clear on the goals, I feel like I can already get started on uh, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll just start writing. Uh, maybe the script. Okay. 
So I got a second page for you that says script uh, on the. So this is we're getting into role division here already on page two. So Adundo, so you want to do script? So scope it out. Like so, what what's your goal? Maybe um, yeah, yeah. So you have some ideas for. So you're thinking of maybe you could start working on a script already. So the video script, like yeah, how many minutes? Two minutes. I would say there's probably a couple of videos. One is like a two minute short, and the rest is like my 15 minute apprenticeship video where I kind of went into things a little bit. Because yeah. I think uh, we definitely want to catch people's attention in a short thing, like two minutes or under, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Start with that. Right. Two minute script. Um, Ken, what do you think you can do to so we can succeed in this amazing challenge, which we're going to launch probably December 1st, if it's six months, it's five months. Maybe we should, uh, should we say like five or six months, maybe January 1st we launch it for Christmas, launch it at Christmas, Christmas gift to the world? Well, I think, I mean, that would be a great uh, time, but... Oh yeah, it's uh, busy. Well, I would, I would say that uh, it should, we should launch it while we're all here because there's going to be a lot of ongoing support that can definitely to discover. Anytime you launch a contest, you know, people are going to ask questions. There's going to be changes that you, need to, you might need to make to the criteria or the rules. And so it's going to require that ongoing support. It's not you push it out to the world. It's not Just, you like launch it. Yeah, yeah. No, you gotta, we got to talk about support roles too. That's one of the requirements. If someone's got to manage it and respond to it. Uh, how about we do it like December 1 then, which still leaves us, because we're s officially this program ends December 22nd before people go home, like 22nd is, or what do you think? Because that's five months, I'm, I'm just saying there's time, like we want to launch it, but yeah, I mean five months is a lot of time, I mean, but we only have so much time to work on it, because mostly we're learning other things and stuff like that. Um, so we want to give ourselves enough time and make sure we're not, when we launch, we're we're not like scrapping for resources at that time. Sure, are you imagining that we only work on this on Saturdays together and then... Uh, I, yeah, Saturdays is dedicated time where we talk about global collaboration. This is certainly global collaboration, so let's focus on this all the Saturdays. So we've got six months of Saturdays, which is like 24 sessions or so. So we just move forward. But yeah, absolutely like work on it anytime off hours if you get time to do it. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, my, my feeling is that there's a lot of unanswered questions, and if it's possible, we launch earlier. Like, I was thinking uh, mm -hmm. three months, but I'm interested in what other people think, but what's feasible as, as well. I actually don't know the so scale of the work. So, three months takes us to, like, <coughs> October, um, but that's, like, the middle of Summer X, where it's going to get a little more intense, because it's, like, back-to-back. -back. Oh, yeah, so at that time, we can either separate from the rest of the activity and work on this, uh, but you're going to want to see most of the, probably most of the activity that's happening. Sure. Uh, and a lot of that will be around housing, right? So uh, I'm just saying, like, the amount of time we have, uh, th these, uh, this time is going to just fly by. Uh, so I, I just want to make sure we have enough time to do it. Unless we get the resources where somebody can sit in the corner and, like, wo work on this full time, you know? Because uh, it, it's going to be a bit of, you know, all this work is going to take a bit of time. It takes, uh, people launch, like, for, for launching on the Hero X project, I think they, they take between, like, two and six months, typically, uh, something like that. Yeah, so we can go on a shorter or longer scale of that. I mean... Well, they're working full-time to launch Hero X, probably, right? Hero X? Well, Hero X, it's an existing platform. Yeah. So, yeah, the, once we get it on there, we, we get the benefit. We're paying for their publicity, effectively, and their, their audience. Because they, I think they have a decent reach. Um, but to get it up there, yeah, yeah. I mean, what what do people think? Well, yeah, I'm also like a little intimidated by the magnitude of the work. It's yeah, it, I mean, it's the first day that I was sort of like asked to uh, participate or contribute to this challenge. Like, 
to be part of the launch team. So that's like uh, the request. So, so let's, yeah. yeah, so let's maybe leave that as an open question. We can, we can refine that. Uh, do people have comments elsewhere? Yeah. Um, it seems like one of the hard things about uh, managing collaboration with this project is that it's really expensive to prototype the hardware. You said yes. like a, a target yes, around, around five thousand dollars. Well, that I think that limits you know who can who can help us to basically very like some very small subsets of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a challenge, and we can address it. Um, one thought about that would be like anyone who's actually building stuff uh, and actually if they're one of the people they're building they're likely to get far in terms of their score and that's where if we have a bunch of rewards for like say it's a hunt say we have a hunt 250k let's look at some numbers 250k we got a reward maybe do a grand prize of 100 G's and then 150 G's 5,000 each uh, that makes for like tw what 20 30 30 times 5 it makes for 30 rewards so 30 people have gone all that way but now there's the idea of partial prototyping there's th little things you can build like maybe pro develop this bearing this 3d printed bearing that's going to cost you 20 bucks in off-the-shelf printer filament stuff like that I could see like ideal would be a person picks okay here's w we do the CAD that's that's free uh, outside of your time and then people can prototype individual aspects of it um, that would be a way you can definitely get like okay here's a okay I can contribute a hundred bucks to this uh, prototyping effort or maybe we could get sponsors for that or something like that maybe we put I that into the sponsorship to, package we need to work with uh, like recycling companies I think that would be an effective way because these companies have like a, a profit incentive to have this technology. Yeah, yeah. Um, if they're selling garbage bales, then they'd be uh, willing to support it. Could be a, a thing to do. So that could be that would be more like um, that's that would be in a sponsorship thing. <clears throat> so yeah, record all these things. Then type them in. So uh, under why why doesn't let's let's have each person do a do a page, but. Ken, we're, what do you think you can contribute? Uh, or think about it. I think it's more on the technical side. Mm. Yeah, the, the technical team, the assessment of the technology and, and preparing that. Okay. Uh, start a page on that. So let's do, let me do, a, I'm going to slide to duplicate. So it's got our branding at the bottom. Uh, so third slide, I'm going to say can technical due diligence technical team. So what would you see that entailing? Looking at the existing um, work that's been done on the... Uh, uh, are we talking specifically about the high temperature chamber or...? We're talking about everything. We haven't really specified, we haven't broken down the problem statement into small parts yet. Okay, because I would say Yeah, well maybe that's, that's can, can on a high temperature chamber. Because we're not going to do this ourselves with the people in this room, we need much more help. We need to do a lot of outreach and sponsorship, or uh, talking to a lot of people, making noise about this, making videos and stuff like that. Um, so keep thinking, but keep keep refining your, uh, page three for can. Um, so Wesley, outreach to recycling centers. Yeah, keep going, Wes. Um, um, one thing is, you know, I think we like. Um, we need to start with like maybe refining like our existing uh, D3D printer. Yeah. Uh, or, or making it um, like right now there are a lot of different like there's a lot of complexity um, in the wiki and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all the slides. Yeah. And I, I think one of the best things I could do is to mm -hmm. work towards building like a decentralized um, 
hardware collaboration protocol, um, or or like an editor for some of this stuff. Uh, editor, like what kind of editor? Um, so I, I think it would be like I, ideally, I think we've got to like combine like all all of this data into a single like like. Um, like real-time multiplayer systems, so you know, like we need to have the slide, like basically a, a Google Slides technology, you know, mm -hmm. JSON in a graph to um, a, CAD, a CAD model. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, Ajinjo and I were talking about like maybe experimenting with Blender's 3D, uh, Blender's multiplayer plugin. How do you get docs in there? Like, what are you thinking to integrate ability to edit and then? Like you think in some integration there? Um, Only thing I can think about is a wiki page with the two embedded side by side. That's simple. <laughs> simple enough. Um, yeah. So you have to kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I, awesome ideas. Executability. Can we do it? Um, yeah. Uh, write it down. Paul, what do you think you could contribute? Or um, do you want to go later? Well, I can definitely make a website. There's an existing design. Can you put on an OSE website? On WordPress? Uh, I'm, or yeah, I can put it on WordPress. Um, sure, if there's an existing design, I, I can put on the website. Are you good at it? You, you, you do websites? I wouldn't say I'm, I'm the best at it, but in terms of what I can say right now, I, I can work on um, that is, that's one thing. I mean, I, I've, mm -hmm. run, it's awesome. I've run programming competitions in the past, um, like college programming competitions, and so mm -hmm. I have some experience sort of how to use criteria and communicate with participants. And communicate with who? Participants. Participants. And, um, I don't know, like how to phrase things. Like, for example, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't even say that we are entering a competition ourselves. I think that totally sends the wrong message and intimidates people mm. from participating. I would say that like, we have reference materials, we have a reference design. All right, all right. And this is where people start. Um, you know, I ran a programming competition in, in college for the winter break, and we had a reference bot that people had to um, work or do better than. And actually, you know, many of the participants couldn't do better than. Our reference, but we gave them the source code for it, and they, um, yeah, they were encouraged to build on it and learn from it. Okay. It. Uh, good so point. That's the marketing tweak that would. All right. I would say, but you know, I'll, I'll be thinking about what what I what's the best thing for this computer. Yeah, th that's that's a good point about the message itself, because if we want to collaborate, like, <coughs> first of all, we don't want to be using the word competing. Like, we're we'll we can compete too. We, we'll collaborate. We're collaborators. Yeah. Um, Paul, do you have a page set up for you yet, or? Uh, like a work or? No, like in a doc, so we capture. Uh, I can start a page. Start a page, please. So capture what you already said, because then you'll magically see that accrete over time. <laughs> you got to seed it. The, the point is, we got to seed things. Prince, you. I see a slide. <coughs> yeah, just like the. Marketing country, <coughs> marketing country for the Heroics page itself. So, I mean, what we're looking for, who we are, what's the challenge, what's the reward, and just answering maybe all those basic overview questions for people to know what they're signing up for or you know, to sign up. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, what would you need to begin working on that? Um, Do you have enough insight at this point? Yeah, probably need more information on like the reward structure and maybe get in line with, you know, whatever the copy is going to be in the video or the script. Um, I don't know if we want like, the same, don't want to like be repeating ourselves probably. Or maybe we do across different mediums, but yeah, probably get started on something. But it might just be like the final product right now. Yeah, maybe start, start on something. Um, for me, I want to do
I want to start on judging criteria because I thought a little bit about this. Does anyone else have that? I'm going to go with judging criteria. Um, slide, duplicate slide, um, march in. Now, with the prior work, just uh, if there's something back there that it piques your interest, take a look at that. But it's, you know, I document everything, so it's like I wrote down all the thoughts I had before, so you can trace all, most of what I've been thinking, and it may not be relevant, or it may be. So take it with a, with that in mind. But I want to do reward structure. Um, not well, judging criteria. That's it's related to reward structure. Uh, two separate things, though. Um, judging criteria. Let's see. Did anyone take reward structure yet? Because I can tackle both of them. Uh, like the plain assets that we, if we think about a hero X incentive challenge, what are you can start by looking at, okay, what's a typical challenge look like, and here's how they structure it, and here's the assets that we need. Because uh, literally right now, just to separate the two different phases, the phase one is we're designing the challenge for a posting. So our work product is actually a posting. And we said, okay, we're gonna have a video in there, we're gonna have uh, a bunch of things. Um, the second phase is where yeah. we open it up and people are competing. No, not competing. <laughs> you should be careful about the language. It's true, Paul, that was a good thing. Um, what do we call it? We're collaborating, and we're collaborating. Um, participating. Um, and therefore we say that participation is open to all. Do we get to um, enter as contestants? Enter as, well, we should have a name for the people who participate. Enter, enter as a participant. Uh, contributor. A contributor. Are yeah. we going to be a contributor? Contributors. So we call, and contribute, and any contributor can uh, be graded. Uh, well, can be judged for the prize because judging criteria. That's the thing. Like with, uh, there's not really a precedent for like um, distributing a prize yeah. in a collaborative way. Right. Effect, like in a way that like. Is like logical. I've yeah. Never seen like there isn't, but we have to come up with something. Like there's like the closest thing would be like um like for example like the Godot um they ha have a Patreon they raise like fifteen they're getting up to like twenty thousand a month and mm -hmm. basically they just hire people to um to fix the things that no one else wants to work on or mm -hmm. that would be really hard or require mm -hmm. like, deep expertise. Yeah. Yeah. So allocating the money to different um, like oh. aspects oh, I that, see, I see. that are really yeah. solved and ah. we, we can't solve them. Oh, okay, okay. That's a different way to think about it. Okay. Oh, so so carving out work to be done. Yeah, and one example would be like they, they paid someone to um, develop that huh. support for X11 on um, Linux because that's like notoriously difficult. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So I have to shift my thinking on that. Um, if I'm taking the so-called judging criteria reward structure. Okay. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Would it be huh. possible to just break down? Yeah. The individual the problems that need to be solved to get there, and then. And then we just say we allocate resources to it. Yeah. Like yeah. whoever solves this problem. Yeah. I get that. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Like we're the project managers, so people will know that their contributions are going to be used somehow. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about milestones. Uh, like milestones, and uh, basically the first that can uh, solve that problem, they get the prize. Ah, okay. Milest so a bunch of milestones and prizes associated with them. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, I like it. Okay.
Huh, okay. Um, Christian, do you have a page set up for yourself? Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking about what to do exactly. Mm -hmm. I've um, basically do some research because I don't know much about the technical side. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I was ba I was thinking about the um, the reward structure as well. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah, um, well that's kind of what I was thinking about doing, so maybe we can uh, share notes on that. So there's some overlap there. And, and, and what do you think about the business model? Like, um, what we are need your one. Thoughts? Like I've, um, there's incentives and like videos about it. Like, uh, that's one of the two notes I thought about it. Um, incentives in one side and video about the other. But I'm not, I'm not really sure on, like, how does uh, the business model kind of uh, fit into, this, into Wait. this kind of situation. Incentives on one side, you said video on another? Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Was that related to business model? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Business I'm, model for the for the incentive will, challenge or for the yeah. production of the printer. Mm, no, I think it's uh, about the collaboration. Okay. About the okay. The business model for collaboration. Mm -hmm. Ah, like it. Mm -hmm. So basically, how to allocate resources in that sense, ah, right? Okay. Okay. So effectively, the business model is effectively how to collect and allocate resources. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I love it. I love it. That's we're moving forward. Yeah, I mean that's the thing we gotta solve. We gotta solve for how you actually make it easy and effective to use this kind of process for collaborative development that replaces proprietary development. That is a 10 Nobel Peace Prizes in economics. <laughs> That's a serious question. That's a very important question. So, thank you for asking that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Matt, do you think you can contribute something to this? Are you still there? Uh, Sam, let's have a yeah. feedback from you. Let's see. Sam, I see photography B-roll. Hmm. Press materials, imagery, aerial. So that would be when you when you come on site. So Sam's participating in the Summer X, so he's going to be here. Sam, were you thinking of bringing some equipment here to do that? Sam, if you're there, you're, you're muted. Mm, that would be. So Sam's talking a lot about graphics, video, imagery. Mm. Yeah. For Im imagery of seed house prototypes, is you can do the the R house right now. It's looking quite nice. Have you guys seen it? Or that's photographable. That's that we can set up, uh, and then we have to build one, uh, which we are right now. So yeah, that that would work. I mean, oh yeah. So some aerial photography on that. Oh yeah, that would be. 
That would be pretty interesting. Um, that's awesome. Now, Sam, are you you just offline or because we're not hearing if you're speaking? Okay. Um, Let's see who else we can interrogate here. Um, Paul, are you available? Uh, no, there's another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a sorry, Paul. Paul C. Paul Choo Choo. How do you say your last name? Okay, he may may not be available. <coughs> Ooh, Elijah, how about yourself? Can you pipe in? Sam, can you can you speak or can you comment or or do you have voice, Sam? Okay, uh, and then. Joshua, are you caught up enough in what we're doing here? So, working with the Hero X Challenge, yeah. made up uh, beta voice. With a big 3D printer that can print from trash plastic, and that okay. can print another CD go home for under $10,000. <laughs> uh, so actually there's some funky verbiage we can create around that. How do we create a really compelling story around that story of cleaning up plastic, uh, production, distributed production, like how does it relate to housing? What's credible, and how how can we uh, communicate it effectively? I mean, the thing that I I think in my mind is, like, if we bluntly speaking, print your house, print yourself a a house from trash for ten thousand dollars. Now we have to clean that up, clean the terminology. Up. But I mean, that's that's how I'm thinking about. It. That, that's the uh, clean up the environment and print a house, print your own house for ten thousand dollars or less. Um, there's a lot of credibility. That, like for me, I can say that because I, I I could see the technology working on that. And for me, it's pretty obvious that that can happen. I think one of the challenges will be like everyone appears to be muted for me. Either Jitsi is glitching or. Oh, not quite sure. We can hear we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, Sam, I'm sorry. I was talking to myself. Oh, all right. Well. Oh man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, you can review. Uh, sorry, I I believe nobody uh let me know that maybe I was speaking and it was on before, but it was only it's only I only haven't been able to hear you for like a minute. Oh, well. Okay, so whoever um. We we came we went through a bunch of uh, little discussion here, so you can review the video once it goes online. But we we're gonna say sure. so so Sam, um, hearing you. So you're gonna bring some equipment down to when when you participate here for the three months, summer X. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and uh, actually was meaning to talk to you about that. It's possible I might be able to free up um, August and December Whoa. if I was able. If yeah, yeah if. You wanted me to come down for the for that period as well. Absolutely, the more the better here. So yeah, we could definitely use the energy. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Yeah. Awesome. You got to uh, see if I can shift things around, but I think I should be able to show up in the early August and stay for the rest of the program. Oh, nice. All right. All right. 
that's great. So yeah, we'll, we can talk about more details on that. Um, but that definitely would help us. And because I mean, it's really about once again showing for people, sh uh, solving for people showing up, and enough energy uh, coming into the project to make it better. That I mean, it's an obvious statement. But um, here's an opportunity, and that's that's what we intend to do with with what we're doing right now to make it available for people to participate full time. Ideally, after the the apprenticeship, there's um, we are actually getting geared up to to open this pretty much for year round operation, and so possibly some people from the from the event here may stay. Most people probably may go, but we're going to continue the apprenticeship. Um, after as well, so mm -hmm. yep, that's great. Well, I'm I'm pretty much local, only a couple hours away, so yeah, uh. yep, that's great. Um, and in terms of today, do you have uh, some time available? To, let's see, like regarding some of the the actual, so Sam, like the photography and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you sticking around for the day today, or? Uh, yeah, how long are you planning on running till? We're going to run till five. So basically we're going to work on the, like we're trying to divide roles up and then actually get some work done on them and get some meaningful progress. So some solid, solid development time. But um, I can point you, the only thing I can start with is I can point you is if you've ever seen the OSC video assets, but maybe you can actually start looking at that because we've got a lot of stuff that's somewhat organized. There's a, it's called video gallery. Uh, let me put, paste the link for everybody. The video gallery is there, and it's got a lot of topics. I mean, there's so much there. There's starting in 2008. Um, so you can just scroll through all of that and, oh, cool. and see a bunch of stuff. Um, I mean, there's some gems in there, and a lot of stuff is just in-process stuff, too. So mm -hmm. maybe, I mean, actually, one role <laughs> is actually organizing those assets as they are, um, like annotating them or possibly move, moving them into galleries, such as at the very bottom, you see mm -hmm. a gallery where I have some thumbnails of what the videos and media assets actually look like. So, um, if you want to, that's I mean it's a task. I don't know if you want to do that, but start taking a look at this and see what what what's relevant that you can pull out for. Like if we have the promo video, there's probably stuff on the torch table or some 3D printing stuff. Um, mm -hmm. We might have a little bit on the shredder and filament maker and stuff like that. So you can start taking a look at that. Um, but other than that, what do you think would be, you know, learning about role division, what do you think, like say we're collaborating like this, what's, um, how can there, is there a way to synergize on that with you today as we, you know, we're, we're working on various assets, um, any thoughts on what you, what you would you could do do today? Uh, well, not being in person there, I can't do any actual photography or videography for, for you. But um, remotely, I can you know take a look at those videos, like you said. And I have a bit of, a bit of graphic design experience. If anything like that's necessary, if we don't have yeah. an actual designer, uh, you know, um, enough to make some print materials or you know whatever else. Paul, did you say? You want to, do you do graphics? I don't do graphics. Does anyone do graphics here? I've done some of my own graphics, like the, the logos that I have for like, mm -hmm. business, but it's not probably going to be the same as his experience. Sam, it's sounds smaller. like sounds like you're you're a graphics guy for now. Outside of there's another guy um, from Brazil. Now let's see, is he is he on here? I don't see him. It's who's actually a pretty good graphics guy too. Mm -hmm. uh, we we should pull him in, but um, maybe I don't know. Maybe like seed something, seed our. Since we're starting on it, maybe seed something like a logo or something, or I don't know. I guess. Um, yeah, anyone that can do what, like anyone that has an idea, like you go on and go, you draw, draw a few of them up and just submit them, and then you pick one. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it's in the process work. Logo, that's like the branding for the the event, so that when we send out media, we we typically use that format. So regarding that, there's 
uh, OSC graphics guidelines, there's a page uh, that we have already that you can maybe build upon. All right. You can take a look at our fonts and colors and stuff. Let me um, paste that in. Yeah. That, I mean, that definitely is valuable, yeah. Um, yeah, and in the next month, I'm going to be uh, sort of, I'm going to try and participate in the online as much, or digital participation as much as I can, but I will be a bit spotty yeah. uh, due to internet connection, etc. I'm not mm -hmm. going to be home, so. But as soon as I uh, can make my way down there, yeah, I'm, whatever you guys need me to do. Mm-hmm. Can you start on the logo logo work today? Sure. Or? Okay. Sure. Awesome. Um In that case, it'd be good to be looped in with whoever's working on like the um, copy and the m copy marketing and branding for the event. Brainstorming mm -hmm. on that, mm -hmm. for, like what the logo is going to say, that kind of thing. What we're like, what style we're moving towards. We're doing dope prints. Um, Paul, are you in that? In on that? On the marketing, Joshua, any, anything on? What, do we finish? I'm typing on my slide, slide now. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, a lot of my experience is uh, similar to most of the other people that have done software, um, do basic graphic design, research and, and data. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's that's something I like doing. Um, also. Helping out with the marketing, or just trying to figure out ways to to funnel or channel people in mm -hmm. from social media. So I mean, there's this Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all like all the places you can grab people from. And trying How to do we do that? So if we have uh, some graphics assets we could generate, we can maybe like start passing around invitation uh, blurbs. That's what you, you can also run a, like like ads. I don't know if you you've done that before, but. Uh, you can run ads that tar target certain markets on the social media platforms and uh, you'll have more visibility that way mm -hmm. rather than just like my network or the various networks of the people here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, we should also be reaching out to journalists, especially the ones who cover any kind of environmental um, uh, news because I think this will that, that'll give us free advertising. And a very targeted audience. Mm. Is this first slide like uh, what 
needs to be done or like a list of tasks. So there's like the, the software pieces, like the web website updates, there's the gaming that Wes is going to do, there's the marketing and copywriting, there's uh, yeah, all of any of the... Yeah, it's just some. And I'll link to, <coughs> on a pri in the prior work, there's... Um, there's a bunch of stuff written there. So, for example, prior work, incentive, onboarding, reward structure. Okay, there's there's already a bunch of stuff there. So, I one thing we can do is just study that and copy that into the current work, or start wiki pages. Like if you do your slide, add to your wiki pages. Now, who's um who's logging in their logs? Um, let's see. Please lo log in your logs because right now it's going to get into the issue of like what are people doing. So one way to organize it is okay, we have the slide, but you can immediately go Joshua log. What'd you do? I, I can see what you did today. Right. So we can coordinate effectively that way. And that's the purpose of the log. Um, also try to keep your hours if that's working for you. Is there an easy place to see everyone's log in one place? Uh, let's maybe uh, set up a slide with that. It's it's gonna be like Paul Fan log, Prince log, Ken log, Joshua log, West log, Marchin log, and Odundo log. So try to make that reasonable name names, and then. Let's see, Sam. Sam needs to have a Sam log. Let's see, does he? Yes, I do. Yeah. There's Sam log, there's Christian log. No. Christian, start one. Um, Elijah log, let's see. Oh, there's actually another Elijah, so that's a different one. Uh, yeah, I placed mine into Elijah yes. from Elder. I'll, I'll have to send you the link, because I need you to do something for me. Okay. Um, that link will go right into my log. Um, and the yeah. last two videos, I need access to. Yes. To um, paste your log in the link there. Oh, right. What's the best way to, to actually make, uh, to, to record on the log? I mean, for instance... Um, edit, well, edit and just put the date on it and just put hyperlinks to other pages typically. Does that make sense? Is that the uh, question? Uh, what I mean is, uh, for instance, now we're working on this, so I have my page here. So if I put stuff on there, yep. how do I link that? How do I Double bracket? Link to what? To a wiki page or to? to my, no, I'm saying to record that on my log that I've done. The hours? Yeah, not the hours, but the actual, to make an entry on the... Um, do a hyperlink, which is double bracket page name, double bracket. Look at look at edit edit my log and see what I'm doing there. You can use anything else on the wiki as a template. So click edit on my log and see what I'm doing. And see how it actually looks. Oh wait, hold on. Is he asking on how to make a page? Yeah. Oh, uh, how do how do you a video about that. <laughs> Yeah, I did. You did. Yeah, b before I started, I went through the um, to the wiki and I made a video about it. Actually. Oh, then paste it up, man. Can, uh, let's, is it um, um, is it in your log? I'll, I'll I'll actually no, I I have to upload it now. Oh, please, yeah. I made it randomly. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, that's great. I'll just upload it and send you the link here. Great. What I do on a wiki, like right now I want Elijah log to go to Elijah Esmeralda. So I'm just putting a redirect because we had another Elijah Pierce 
was an architect working. Yeah, I saw that. So yeah. Now when you type in Elijah log, it goes to your log. So just redirects like yeah. that. It's useful. So feel free to use the wiki as a brain with where you put like shortcuts or like pages that have your stuff or whatever, or just on your log too. And so double brackets and yeah. So, um, yeah, just uh, watch those two videos. It's uh, pretty short, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a tutorial on how to give other people access on your YouTube channel without giving sensitive information. Now, you go to the uh, YouTube studio, right, and then you go to the oh, Do you have headphones? I don't know. Uh, Can I borrow some headphones from somebody? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Um, We should okay. we should put a slide in like we can link to everybody's log. Right. You know, I didn't put know it up front know. under. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's definitely useful. Yeah. Genius lets you shop over fifteen life insurance companies and. one place. Here's how it works. Okay, so this is a tutorial on how to give other people access on your YouTube channel without giving sensitive information. Now, you go to the uh, YouTube studio, right, and then you go to settings, and then you go to permissions, 